Uh, my name is Richard T, and together with Carla Bonina, we would very much like to welcome you uh, to this seminar on digital transformation. Uh, we have a very exciting guest, uh, Andrew de Rosairo, who's currently at, uh, at Microsoft. Uh, this seminar is also co-organized by the Code uh, Research Center. So for those of you who are not familiar, I'll just say a couple of words on Code. Uh, so code is the center of the digital uh, economy, right? It's a multidisciplinary research center at the University of Surrey led by uh, Professor Annabel Gower. There's a lot of work in this area, uh, especially on, on digital platforms. And it's a multidisciplinary center, right? So we don't have people just from the business school. We also have folks from engineering, from sociology, uh, and also many different departments uh, within the business school, right? including accounting, uh, finance, organization, people from business transformation. Uh, and then we also have folks from the department of the digital economy, entrepreneurship and innovation, which is where Carla and I uh, are, are based uh, organizationally. So this topic of, of digital transformation is, is very closely connected to our own work. So Carla um, is um, working on um, um, many different related issues, especially, uh, for example, how governments handle digital transformation, uh, role of digital platforms, issues like sustainable development. Uh, she also has deep expertise on, on, on Latin America and has advised a variety of stakeholders, including government, startups, uh, impact investors, uh, international organizations uh, on these different topics. Um, for myself, also interested um, the topic of, of digital platforms, right? You think of platforms we're all familiar with like Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, right? But also sort of B2B uh, platforms, um, and I look at these issues both from a typical sort of firm level uh, perspective, but also the, the sort of broader impact, right? For those who've been following issues around big tech, um, you know that there's a rising, uh, let's say policy interest in how to, to best govern uh, these digital platforms. Um, and more recently, there's even a sort of, a, let's say a geopolitical element to big tech that I think is also really uh, quite exciting. Um, so I've been also looking at not just the typical uh, digital settings, like let's say cloud computing, uh, smartphones, telecoms, but also more, let's say mature industries that are being transformed uh, by digital, trans uh, digital technologies, right? like construction, uh, like the media, like mobility or transport. So yeah, lots of um, digital related work going on at the center. Um, so there's also a Twitter account that you can follow if, if you're interested in, in getting to know more uh, about the center. Okay, so that's um, enough about code. So let me move on to our main speaker, right? So as I mentioned before, Andrew uh, De Rosairo is currently a senior executive uh, at Microsoft. Right, where he is focused on many different issues, but including, uh, for example, how customers in, in energy, in transportation, how they deal with digital transformation, uh, as well as the use of, of, of topics like big data, right, artificial intelligence. And we'll be focusing uh, on these issues in our, uh, in our interview. Um, and so Andrew also has some uh, startup experience, right? During the first internet bubble, right? That some of us will recall from the uh, early 2000s. Um, so I think if I have it right, Andrew, you've been involved in even two startups, right? Um, and then also before joining Microsoft, um, he held various pos positions at uh, SAP. Right, so which uh, many of you might know, but it's a German um, B2B uh, sort of enterprise software company, right? very influential, uh, where he was most recently a global VP of customer innovation. Okay, before I hand it to Carla, just a couple of, again, practical issues 
the set at the start, right? So we'll first have a couple of questions from me and Carla, right? But then we'll open it to the audience. So uh, you don't have to wait till the questions are over, right? I can already see that some people have uh, started adding some questions. So uh, feel free to add these uh, as we go along and then we can ask those questions on your behalf. Okay, so that's enough preamble. I think I'm going to open it to Carla. Feel free to unmute yourself and let's get going. Excellent, thank you very much, Richard. And very warm welcome to you all. Thank you, we're I think closer to a hundred of attendees today. Andrew, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Before we move into the question, I think, you know, Richard really did a very good job in introducing yourself, but is there anything else you want to add about the current role? Um, uh, just, you know, a, a one or two minutes to, to, to compliment the introduction about yourself. Yeah, so thanks, and and really, um, I really look forward to uh, to this session. Um, I love talking about digital transformation and and just having discussions about it, uh, getting different people's perspectives. Um, you'll see a beach in the background. That's kind of where I would like to be, um, uh, but I'm actually based in the UK. I actually live in Richmond, which uh, obviously part of Surrey um, and not too far from your campus. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to come and visit um, uh, soon. And I, I think there, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really kind of quite passionate about is, is not just kind of the big data side of transformation, but also small data, right? And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit. It shouldn't just be about um, making sure that we we support huge decisions in, in offices, but it's really about changing what we do at the front line. That's, I think it's gonna be super relevant and we're gonna make sure to touch on that. I think as Richard mentioned, one of the big themes um, that we hear uh, you know, in the last month has been digital transformation. Uh, no wonder the pandemic has exacerbated this, um, whether you like it or not, but you know, governments, big, small organizations all have to embrace it um, with different resources. And, and as Richard mentioned, we know, um, and that's how we take it in the center as well, that this is more a journey than an end in itself. So I think we'd like to start with this initial question to you, Andrew. So what does digital transformation mean today? And how is it achieved? Um, yeah, so I think the, the way I, I like thinking about this digital transformation, um, McKinsey actually had uh, a, an article um, that was was really about why boards should should be thinking and how they should be thinking about digital transformation. And the first question um, that they asked was, how is digital going to change the basis of competition in our industry? Right. And I think that's, you know, that is really the the really big question, which is um, uh, and, and sometimes you, you can frame it in different ways, right? So for the transportation industry, you know, what if Uber were to come into the shipping industry? What would they do differently? And how, how could you respond to that, right? So it's, it's really getting people to think about, um, you know, what is the basis of competition in our industry today? And how is that going to change? Um, and are we prepared for it? Do we have the right skills? Do we have the right capabilities? Do we have the right organizational structure? Um, and that, you know, that plays out in, in different ways. You, you talked about COVID um, kind of really uh, driving digital transformation. There are lots of things that we couldn't possibly imagine having, you know, doing before all online. You know, the, um, I, I think in the first weeks or our teams meetings, um, our teams kind of volume went up 950%. It's like, oh my God, you know, let, let's um, use, you know, as, shift as much kind of data center capability to, to support that. Um, there are other external kind of factors that are driving digital transformation for, for companies. Now, I'll take the example of BP and um, 
obviously the you know there's huge push towards sustainability but for bp to come out and say we're going to reduce our uh, our production by 40% in the next decade that's huge right that's like saying you know 40% of our current business is not going to be there in 10 years um, so that's the external side what does that mean for them it means that they need to think about um, how are they going to operate in this in this new business in this renewables business and guess what it's a much lower margin business right so they really need to think about the ways of working that we've used in the past they're not going to work in future we need to rethink um, our processes, the way that, uh, that we engage with customers, the way, the way our employees work. And, and that's driving a, a completely different discussion about um, this isn't a matter of tweaking our, our current processes. We need to rethink them, right? We need to, we need to completely uh, ask ourselves the question. I'd like you to expand a bit more on that. And that's something I've seen, you know, in my work with uh, digital government and digital transformation in government that yeah. they all say like, yeah, yeah, we need to change processes. But actually, in your experience, how is this digital transformation achieved? What are these new trends that will actually allow you to be more competitive, to align your strategies, to really redesign and redefine your business models or, or, or all these processes to actually uh, transform uh, digitally, right? So, so I, I think there are a couple of things that, that we are starting to see, right? And, and one of them is this, this idea, and you know, we've heard it millions of times, every company is becoming a software company. Um, I think more and more companies are actually starting to really take that seriously, right? So um, the average modern car has over 100 million lines of code, 100 million. These aren't self-driving cars. These are normal cars. Um, and so, you know, companies like Volkswagen have turned around and say, in the same way that we set up factories, we need to think about setting up software factories, right? How do we do this at scale? And so one of the things, you know, in that case, they actually reached out to Microsoft and say, hey, I heard you're pretty good at, um, at developing software. Can, can you help us? And we, we've set up this, this joint development um, center in Redmond where we are helping them recruit and train software engineers, right? So it's... Um, I think it's partially this realization, and, and it's not just VW, it's, it's, um, it's companies across the board really thinking about how do we build the software skills um, that are going to be important if we're going to think about this, this different approach um, to working. I think that the second one, um, this one of the, the other really big challenges is you know, different ways of working. So, um, I think in the in this digital economy, you you've got to recognize that that IT or your digital capabilities, it's not a department, right? It's not a cost center, it's not it's not us and them. Um, and so we've seen some companies. I've, I've worked with a company in the in the logistics area, who've actually said we're going to take our entire organizational structure and we're going to move away from the divisions that we have today. And we're going to think about what are the digital platforms that we need to build um, in order to be able to satisfy customers. And then what we will do in, in terms of organizational structures is we're going to put two in a box, right? We're going to have a digital lead or we're going to have a kind of a technical lead and a business lead jointly owning each of these digital platforms. And, you know, it was majorly disruptive, right? So the, the organization who were used to thinking about divisions and departments are now thinking, you know, we're organized by digital platforms and we have joint leadership of, of kind of business and IT working together. So I think mm -hmm. those are some of, the, some, some of the things that we see, some of the trends that we see. I, I think that's super interesting and, and... Is there any challenge that you see also, you know, in that disruption of merging these two groups together, what challenges uh, emerge? Um, I think first of all, it's, it's um, 
kind of getting away from this idea that, uh, first of all, IT is is a cost center, right? Um, I think you know one of the the big things that um, uh, that a lot of companies are are kind of going through is is getting the execs to recognize that um, that IT isn't isn't about kind of just the enterprise applications where the only value that we get seems to be whatever we put into it, right? So um, you know we we enter information and it gives us something back. Um, data and AI is really changing kind of the, the nature and the way we're doing things, but also what we're doing. Um, I think that's the first big challenge. It's not, oh, it's an IT thing. That's someone else's problem, right? So uh, you talk to someone in, in an energy company and you say, you know, I'm really focused on, on drilling and production. Why do I need to understand this technology stuff? That's the IT department. Actually, it's changing the way that we're doing drilling and exploration and so on. And so it, it's really important. And I think, you know, more and more of these business leaders need to kind of upskill uh, and really understand what is the impact of technology in their different domains. I think it's super powerful what you yeah. just say, and I think we're going to move to the second round shortly. Uh, just a reminder that for all of you that are there, maybe from IT departments or the business lead, do put your questions on the Q&A. Uh, know that you can also vote if you have a, you know, a similar question and you already have some people very curious about of the, some of the things uh, you're going to cover. So uh, let's, let's keep, uh, I think, talking about uh, related stuff that now Richard is going to lead. Yeah, no, I think what you said, Andrew, about uh, customers in, for example, energy, um, the different competencies, right? That also leads into this topic of, of big data, right? And how companies use data. Um, and, you know, you've worked with, with many different types of, of customers, right? In different industries. And I would assume also with many different uh, levels of competencies. Right? and also awareness about their competencies and also knowing which ones are more uh, or less relevant, right? So um, can you walk us through a little bit how, how you deal with, with these you know, opportunities and challenges in terms of um, you know, working with customers, thinking about their requirements, and also then thinking about what their, what their actual requirements are, right? In terms of trying to get into whatever solution uh, they're aiming for? Uh, yeah, so um, I think, you know, I think whenever we talk about AI, uh, whenever we talk about leveraging big data, um, everyone jumps to, hey, you know, what's the algorithm? Um, and that's really important. Or, you know, can't we just go out and hire a few data scientists and, and get them to start working? And yeah, yeah that's part of it. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges that, that we see is that um, we're not great at making sure that we're answering the right, or that we're asking the right questions, or that we're answering the right questions, or thinking about kind of all the way to, um, to putting this into production, right? So actually making this happen. And let me give you a couple of examples of some, you know, where, where things have gone well and, and other places where it's gone badly. So um, the first one is asking the right question. We, uh, we had a call a few years ago from, um, from a company running in, in the consumer products industry. Um, and they came to us and they said, uh, we need your help um, on this production line. Um, we think we're, we're, we're paying too much for maintenance and we want to reduce the amount of maintenance. Can you help us with data and AI to, to reduce the amount of maintenance? So we're thinking, okay, um, you know, we, we can certainly take a look at that. And, and so the, the first round of questions was, you think you're paying too much for maintenance compared to what? You know, is it compared to someone else in the industry or is it compared to, you know, as a percentage of revenue? And no, it's just a gut feel. We're paying too much for maintenance. Okay. Um, so, you know, we started taking a look. We, we had, um, 
we had uh, an interesting call. So we were, we were there for kind of a short project, three months. How can you help us um, make this change? And so the first call we had was with their, um, their, their process engineering team, their statisticians. And they said, yeah, uh, this guy was based in, in uh, the Southern US. Um, uh, you know, I've been working on this project for 12 years with 10 PhDs. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys think you're going to do in six weeks. Um, so we, we knew we were going to get a lot of help from this guy. No pressure. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No pressure there. Um, so we, we, we had started asking a few more questions and we said, okay, so it, like, if we reduce the amount of maintenance um, spend that you have and your quality drops a little bit, is that okay? And they said, no, 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 absolutely not. The quality has to go up. Okay, so, so now we're getting to the real problem, which is you actually want to improve the quality while reducing your maintenance. And that's slightly different. Um, and I think this is, is kind of one of the things Whenever you, whenever customer or or someone thinks about, you know, what is the the challenge that we're trying to address with AI, um, uh, you really have to kind of spend a lot of time asking enough questions to make sure that they, you know, that they are being, uh, that they're asking the right question, right? That that you're getting what when you when you figure something else using data and AI, that it's actually going to be valuable to them. Because if we'd gone ahead and said, you know, here's a way of reducing your unplanned downtime and your your maintenance, but your quality is going to suffer a little bit, it would have been useless, right? Yeah. And and this is what we see with, with lots of projects. You you start off on a project, you try and deliver what the customer is asking for, and then they say, actually, we can't use it. Um, what we also found out is, okay, so we've developed this model using data and AI, uh, and it it allows a, uh, a worker on the production line with a 76% accuracy to say, the first time I see a reject on the production line, I can differentiate between this is just a, you know, a, a random problem, or this is the beginning of a, of a long um, production issue, right? And so either ignore it or I need to switch the machine down and, and do some maintenance on here. 76% were thinking, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and they came back and told us at 76%, we will never use it, right? Mm -hmm. If one in four times that we switch the machine down, we, we shut the production line down to try and fix this. If one in four times, we were wrong and there wasn't a production issue, it's useless to us, right? So we actually had to keep working. We managed to get it up to 87%. And you're thinking 76 to 87%, that's 11% difference. It's not, it's 100% difference because at 87%, they say it's close to one in 10. We think the system is gonna get better. One in 10 is something that we can accept, right? So. When you're thinking about these AI solutions, you really need to think about what's the outcome that we want to change and what's the accuracy level that we need in order to convince the people who are actually running the production line to do something about it, right? Yeah. And if it's, you know, if, it's, if it's 87% and you're only at 76, it's gonna be a failed project. Yeah, no, that's it's that's 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 really fascinating, and I think that's also this doesn't go just to the topic of of, of data and digital transformation. This probably applies to many uh, consulting projects in general, right? It's about expectations management. It's about getting it, um, you know, ambitious but also realistic. <laughs> and digital is not necessarily just some magic wand that will solve all your problems, right? In terms of efficiency, in terms of quality. Um, and, and absolutely, but it, you know, it, it, it's also um, uh, one of the things that we found is is that sometimes com companies ask us um, to solve kind of problems with data and AI, but they're not willing to make changes in in kind of the way they. Uh, they take decisions and I'll, I'll give you, I'll kind of give you a good example and a bad example. So we worked with a big um, retailer 
and uh, gathered lots of data from all their stores across the U.S. and and uh, and we said, you know, t give us some insight. Uh, we've got this big team of uh, data scientists there. And I said, um, we're seeing a spike of hot roasted chickens in Dearborn, Michigan at 2.30 in the morning. So you're thinking, hot roast chickens at 2.30 in the morning. What's going on here? So we went to talk to the, the store manager and he said, um, oh, yeah, it's easy. There's an automotive plant uh, with a shift change at 2 o'clock and all the workers are driving home and they don't want to cook when they get home. So they order, you know, they pick up a hot roast chicken. The nice thing about it is they acted on it, right? So they said, okay, let's put things like um, pizzas, right? Microwave pizzas next to it. And, and they set up this whole environment where people coming home from work at 2.30 in the morning could stop and get a quick meal. So there's, there's someone who's willing to act on something. Um, we had someone else, another retailer who said, um, uh, we want to kind of scrape the price of all our competition, um, and we're going to make um, we're going to make pricing decisions based on all this data. Uh, and can you please update this information every minute? Sure. How do you make this pricing decisions? Oh, there are five of us who get together every week. We sit in a room and we decide the prices. <laughs> are you willing to change that? Uh, no. Okay, well, in that case, scraping the competitor's prices every minute and trying to make changes that way is not gonna do you any good, right? So we actually abandoned that. So it's, it's this willingness to act on the result that, that's gonna make the difference between not just whether the expectation is right, but are you gonna get any value for the project that you've done? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, something like this, right? Pricing algorithm that might work let's say for Amazon, right, might not necessarily be, be useful if you're a physical retailer. You don't want to dynamically adjust your prices every, uh, every minute, like you yep. said. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the third question. So I'll hand it over to, to Carla. Andrew, this is really great insights. And I think the examples are very, very useful to make sense of what we hear all the time, right? And I think with artificial intelligence or AI is now the new catch uh, uh, word term, right? Everyone wants to apply it. Even in my work with governments in Latin America, they're like, well, we, we just want to put AI in our procedures. Okay, so when you go and revise how they collect their data, oh, it's all paper-based. Well, good luck. <laughs> but so it's it's another, you know, I think very, very good um, illustration of how these things become, you know, all over the place. And you would need to get back to that idea of digital transformation is about changes that go beyond technology. So great points that you're bringing. And, and please keep uh, adding your questions there. We have very interesting things appearing from the audience. Um, over a hundred people uh, joining today. So so you mentioned AI and you gave good examples. Tell us, you know, briefly, you know, how are different industries leveraging AI today? Um, so I, I think um, there, there are a couple of kind of big trends that we're seeing, right? So one is, um, yes, the traditional AI gathering lots of data from sensors and so on is is uh, is being widely used across industries. I think one of the big trends that we're seeing is that people are recognizing um, that images and sound have huge amounts of, of uh, untapped benefit, right? So um, uh, you, you talked about the construction industry before, you know, they're using cameras and they did it initially for one reason, which was to say, okay, um, I'd like to be able to use cameras, uh, video cameras, in order to spot um, if a person is walking in a in a zone and not wearing a hard hat, right? And and they said, okay, so we can do that now. Um, but actually, there are lots of other things that we're we can start seeing as we start analyzing this video. We can start seeing, you know, how many moves of um, of uh, equipment do we have here? What's the concentration of people in different areas? Um, you know, how long is our different um, jobs taking? Can we build predictive models that say how much is, is a job running behind because these things haven't happened? So I think there's um, there's a huge 
uh, untapped potential looking at, 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 um, at vision, but also sound, right? So we're working on an offshore platform with this engineer um, and, uh, and, and he was famous because, you know, he could put his ear to the side of this, this uh, well bore, you know, the, this pipe that goes uh, hundreds or thousands of, of uh, meters down and he could hear what was happening. He could say, oh yeah, seems to be grinding a little bit. We're probably gonna have a, a problem in a couple of hours. And you're thinking, wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, how can we, you know, how can we take that and digitize it? So uh, we ran some fiberglass down it. We're collecting lots of sound data. And then we're using something called machine teaching where we're taking the experience from this person um, and, and in a sense using his experience to train these algorithms to spot the kinds of things that, that he could spot just by having worked in this environment for the last 30 years. So I think this, um, this vision and the AI is, uh, is interesting. You know, the, the, the ability of, of cloud compute and, and some of the new techniques like reinforcement learning and, and uh, combining that with simulation means that we're attacking problems that we couldn't attack before. Um, we're working on one project right now for wind turbines, uh, you know, in a wind, uh, wind farm. Um, the, you know, the, the uh, each turbine kind of maximizes it. it has a control system that maximizes its output right so um you know how can i how can i adjust the yaw so the direction and the pitch and so on to get the most energy from this wind um it turns out that the first turbine in the wind park actually affects the ones that are downstream right so um, the turbulence caused by the first turbine means that the second and, and the ones downstream are less effective. So now we're thinking about a problem that says, how do we get these turbines to think like team players, right? Not that I want to generate the most power for me, but how do I get the whole team, the whole wind farm to operate at the best level? So we're you know, we're, we're saying to some turbines, actually, you need to operate at the lower levels. You need to maybe even turn out of the wind um, in order to make sure that the, the turbines downstream uh, are able to generate more power. So this, um, we're attacking all kinds of interesting problems. And I think the, the third big, big um, trend that we see is people are starting to recognize that they need to put more AI at the edge, right? It's great to have AI to, to drive big decisions for, um, for hundreds of people, but if we can get it out onto mobile devices, um, it means that it changes tens of thousands of people. So did the, we're doing this project, um, someone's, uh, we have lots of inspection workers and they go out and they take pictures of, um, uh, of their machinery. And one of the things that they take pictures of is welding joints, right? And we've taken enough pictures of welding joints to be able to say, uh, you take the picture and it automatically applies classification algorithm and it says, that's a good one and that's a bad one. And if it's a good one, here's the process that you need to follow. But if it's a bad one, I need three more pictures and I'm going to kick off a uh, uh, a kind of new workflow to make sure that we prioritize some uh, some maintenance on it. So pushing AI to the edge, making it more accessible to frontline workers, to tens of thousands of workers, is a is a really big topic. And this uh, we, we talk a lot about low code platforms. The combination of low code to create kind of digital. Um, processes on on mobile devices, plus the ability to to embed AI at that edge on, on those edge devices, I think is going to be one of the game changing um, technology trends of of the next few years. Awesome! I think there are lots of other things I would like to follow. Um, 
up, especially you know the challenges and the ethics. But we would like to move a bit of there are really interesting questions yeah. from the audience that that perhaps uh, we'll like the opportunity to to say a bit more uh, from your perspective. So Richard, and please keep adding the questions, and you can vote for questions. I can see some of the questions moving up. So let's get started with with the audience, and we will follow up. I'm sure with yeah. some of the AI implications. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think Carla, one of the, some of these broader issues. There, I see at least one question that also touches on some of these broader issues. So let's start with the highest voted question by Simran Arab. Um, there are so many sectors of technology built around big data and I and AI. Uh, which industry or upcoming industry do you think will become the biggest over the next few years? Uh, this could be for users, for employability. Um, so this is a sort of a forward-looking question. Your vision, Andrew. This is, <laughs> we're going to buy a lottery <laughs> tickets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, listen, uh, I think in the past, the, the industries that have made best use or been most mature in terms of data and AI have been uh, the financial industry, it's been the retail industry. Um, I think in, in future, as we, start as we start leveraging more of the IoT data and, and sound and vision and so on, I think we're going to, uh, we're going to see a shift to um, more being done in in some of let's say some of the less uh, people centric ones. So I think things like construction, I think manufacturing, I think that energy, um, especially as we start kind of making the shift towards more sustainable energy, I think those are going to be big drivers behind it. Um, so those are the industries. I think the big game changing trend is this is this low code approach, right? It's not, it's not just about having the big data in the, in the big boardrooms. Um, and this, I mentioned this right at the beginning. I think it's also lots of small data with small AI on mobile devices at the edge. I think that's the other really big, uh, big change that I see happening. Awesome, I think. Still big trends and a lot to be seen. Uh, a follow-up question here. Uh, can you discuss digitization from the strategy development perspective? Uh, how companies or your clients, you know, um, uh, formulate digitization strategies? Uh, I am asking these questions, says um, uh, Nima, uh, as using AI for a specific purpose is not a strategy formulation. Digitization also should be about changing the business model, something that you said and you emphasized already. So uh, what else can you add, Andrew, to this point? Um, so it, it's, it's a really good question. And you know, we, we touched a little bit on some of the organizational change, the people who are thinking about digital platforms. I think the, you know, some of the business model changes that, that we see um, are also driving this change in strategy, right? So uh, in the one that everyone kind of knows and talks about is, is Rolls-Royce, right? So instead of selling um, jet engines, they sell power by the hour, right? So they, they, um, their agreement with, and, and this is happening in, across every industry, right? We, we're talking about product as a service. We're talking about energy as a service. We're talking about coffee as a service with Nespresso. You, you, don't, you, you don't buy the Nespresso machines. You're actually, what you really want is you want to buy coffee. Um, and so this, uh, this digital strategy needs to underpin that. It's great that we're thinking about offering as a service. Now, instead of downtime being the customer's problem, downtime becomes our problem, right? We're going to make decisions about when to send out field service engineers. We need to monitor these products and make sure that they're up and running because they're, if they're not up and running, we're losing money. It's not the customer losing money anymore. So this, um, there's this change in business model that is being driven um, partly by, you know, by, by the, the cloud 
the cloudification of everything. You know, I, I don't want to pay for, um, I, I only pay, want to pay for what I consume, right? I only want, I want utility-based pricing instead of, you know, perpetual licenses or, or, or and, and this is starting to permeate every single industry, right? Um, I, I had a discussion a couple of weeks ago with around poultry as a service, right? It's a different, not platform as a service, poultry as a service. So these are people who are, um, who are developing uh, um, egg sorting machines, uh, you know, but the, their view is we need to, to change our mindset away from just selling these machines to customers and really selling this capability. And, and that requires a completely, both a different business model, but a different digital capability that goes behind it. Thank you. Yeah, let's. I, I see at least two more questions that have at three votes. So let me start with Henry Lopez, who has a question about. So we go to paraphrase a little bit, but you know that digital technologies are important for the transformation of industries like newspapers, automotive. Yet societies and government might resist technological change and or misuse the benefits of technologies. Think of Uber, uh, scooters, banking. Here's the key part. How could government users, companies, and so forth enable a faster adoption of digital technologies for the benefit of all? Again, this is a very <laughs> broad question, but it, it's, you have something it's, to say. It's a broad question, and um, I, I think there, there are multiple kind of sides to it. So one is, you know, how, how do we get um, how do we enable uh, the gathering of data to be easier? Um, there was a there was a great project that we did uh, that I was involved in some years ago in um, for Boston, right? So anyone who's ever been to Boston, you know, there are potholes in Boston roads where you can you know you can swallow up small cars, right? They are huge and they are everywhere, um, and so uh, Boston kind of city decided we need some way of capturing all the data to, to prioritize which, which potholes to fix. And so they, they created this app, which people could download. They put it on their, on their phone. And as they're driving along, you know, it's, it's got all these accelerometers and so on. And so you could see by gathering all this data, where are the potholes, how big are they, and how many people are they affecting? And so they prioritized it. Of course, there were some smart engineers who found this out. And so they started rolling their car back and forth across these potholes to get them prioritized and get them done first. So um, I think it's partly about, you know, let, let's find a way of collecting data easily. I think the other side is, is the ethic side, right? So it's um, uh, people's, you know, one of people's reservations is, is about how technology is, is being used badly. Um, and uh, so two things. So that I'm, I'm quite proud of. One is uh, our, our chief legal officer uh, at Microsoft actually um, stepped up and said, um, we would like more regulation in this industry, right? And, and you're thinking, you know, when did anyone working for a business ask for more regulation, right? But this is one of those cases. And he said, look, you know, we, um, we can put some controls in place, but we actually think that the government sh should step in and put more, you know, more controls into place to make sure that certain AI capabilities are not being misused. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I was actually working on a project with, uh, with an airport and um, we, we wanted to create this seamless experience for the passenger so that you don't have to, kind of wait in immigration queues and you don't have to, you know, check in and, and go through things. Everything happened by, you know, face recognition, right? So it's this seamless experience walking up to the plane and boarding. Um, and about kind of two weeks starting into this project, um, I actually got a, a, an email and a call from, uh, from our AI ethics team who said, you're involved in a project involving facial facial recognition. We need to review it, right? This is not something I asked for. It's not something, 
you know, where I had to kind of go off and start a new process, anything that touched face recognition is automatically forwarded to the ethics team. And they say, we want to look at it. And if we think that there's a chance of this being used in a bad way, we'll kill it. It's over. So um, I think those are maybe some of the hurdles to, to try and encourage more, more governments, more, more citizen-based um, uh, use of AI. That's great coverage, uh, Andrew. And, and I think it's, it's, I like that question because of that, right? We just launched the, the AI uh, People Center Institute uh, at the university, precisely working cross-disciplinary in issues like this. So um, there is another question I will move slightly now that has to do with recent graduates, right? So um, someone says, okay, some of the attendees will be students or recently graduated graduated, and uh, who are looking for careers in the area of AI, big data. What's your advice? How to get into this area? Um, so, so, so a couple of things. So first of all, I think, um, uh, Kind of coming back to this, to one of the the topics that I started with, it's great, you know, if you uh, if you're a data scientist and and you kind of know the difference between a random forest and a yeah, you know, and all the different kinds of algorithms. But the ones who are most valuable are the ones that um, that do two things, right? So the ones that really um, are, are curious and are um, and are really kind of willing to sit with the business and truly understand the business enough and ask enough questions so that you make sure that you're solving the right problem. Um, and then thinking about kind of this all the way through to production, right? So it's it's not just, hey, I created this algorithm and it's 76% accurate. I'm done, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there, right? If you if you don't get it into, if you don't actually get it in, into production, if the people don't accept it, you're not actually adding any value, right? So I think that um, I think that that uh, data scientists who can think about more than just the algorithm, right? Who can really think about how am I going to get that data? then what kind of algorithm, and then how do I make sure that it actually gets implemented um, so that the end users actually get value from it? Those are the ones who I think are gonna be the most valuable, the most sought after um, uh, in the industry. That's, that's great advice. And I think it connects really well with what you said at the beginning, digital transformation is about understanding both worlds, right? It's not just data or not just business. And, and I think you're you know, right on top. So go and, and review what you need to do, <laughs> the students and, and graduates there. I think it's great, great advice. Um, Richard, if you want to follow up with another? Yeah, yeah, this leads, leads nicely to a question also about education more generally by Martin Klopper who asks, um, so some of the topics we've been talking about, right? AI, big data, digital transformation, how are these impacting the world of education delivery services um, more generally, right? And also uh, particularly at the elementary and high school levels, like kindergarten through grade 12. Uh, Andrew, are you aware of, um, yeah, any of the impact, maybe you've even been working with, with customers uh, from education. Yeah, so um, we've done some work with, um, with, with students. It tends to be more university than, um, than kind of primary and elementary schools, partly because of uh, lots of the issues around data privacy and, and kind of security concerns with um, with with monitoring younger than that, but one of the things that um, that was done at one of the universities in the U.S. is they um, they tracked people's attendance, 
right? And they tracked people's attendance um, in different courses and they, they monitored how they were doing and with different bits of homework. And it wasn't, um, it was interesting because it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, you know, to turn around and say, you know, you've missed 30% of your, uh, of your classes, therefore, you know, we're going to do this to your grade. It was actually kind of a, a recommendation engine. It said, you know, people who are missing 30% uh, of their classes, um, a lot of them aren't really so interested in this course. And many of them have actually switched into these other courses. You know, so it, it's kind of giving you um, a, a little bit of kind of behavioral insight based on some of the data that it was collecting. It was absolutely nothing, you know, it wasn't feeding it back to, to the, the dean of the school or, or um, you know, affecting your grades. It was really trying to, to say um, people who are missing more than 30% of the classes um, tend to get these grades or lower. So if you're not able to make it to the classes or you're not enjoying it as much, you may actually want to drop the course, mm. right? Yeah. Because it, it's actually going to pull down your grade point average. So it's, it, um, overall, it changed the, um, the success rates of the students just by giving them this, this kind of data-driven um, insights. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting because I think if you're in a class, you know, in elementary school or high school with 20 to 30 students, any good teacher would pick up on that sort of organically, let's say. But of course, if you're in a much more uh, higher uh, rate sort of anonymous course, that is something that the data can actually help you with. And, and it's a little bit more elective, right? You, you don't yes. get the choice about whether yeah. you attend certain oh, sorry, classes at school. True. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, uh, yes, so here we have one that I think is pretty interesting, and I think you already covered some of this, Andrew, so we can be brief, but um, like it says, if we do digital transformation in call center industry, um, and to what extent I think that's what it's mean here, we set up the automatic response. However, most of the time, it leads us to the wrong direction from customers' primary issue, right? So you all the time is speaking like, no, I said one, no, I said. <laughs> so basically, how can we fix that? Is that something we can fix? And, and is that the problem of AI? Or, or what are your, your views on, on that automation of you know, many services we use these days? And they drive me nuts, right? So. Um... You, know, you get into one of these loops and say, you know, I'm, I'm looking for such and such. Did you mean this? No. <laughs> um, so I, and I think there are two things. So one is um, uh, we're starting to see, first of all, the, the voice recognition is always going to keep improving, right? So, so that's going to happen naturally. Um, I think the other thing that we're starting to see is that we're, we're starting to also take a look at tone, right? This customer is getting seriously pissed off. Um, let's move them to a human um, so that they can answer the question directly, right? So it, it's really picking up on the, um, not just the, the words that they're saying, but really the emotions, um, because you need that in order to be able to um, to deal more effectively with, uh, with the calls coming in. Um, I do think that uh, I think I, I think the automated systems are overused and badly implemented in lots of cases, right? Where um, you know we, we give people twenty four choices, and by the time they get to the twenty fourth, they've already hung up, right? But there's much too much of that. So we we need um, we we need smarter triage uh, and maybe faster triage of which are the things that can be handled um, in voice base, you know, in, in automated systems, in, in uh, chatbots, and which ones do we move quickly to, uh, to a human for resolution? Totally. But I, I think in short, we get to experience a lot of frustration. So <laughs> uh, that's, that's the way it is. I think we, we might we have, be very, yeah. yeah. We have Sorry. three more minutes. So we could, my suggestion is I could ask Andrew, 
two questions and you can choose Andrew which one you want to answer because okay. they're quite different. Okay. One is uh, a very big one. What is your thoughts on the United States being able to catch up if you consider it to be behind China in surveillance AI? That's option one. Option two is, <laughs> uh, Andrew, curious to know about your startup, which you were involved in during the internet bubble. <laughs> to you, which one do you want to answer? Uh, so um, I'll try and do both. The internet startup was, um, was kind of a, similar to let's buy .com, right? So it's a demand aggregator. So, um, how many people can we bundle together to buy a PDA? Um, I think it was just too early for its time. Uh, and we, we ended up closing it down early and giving money back to investors. And by doing that, we outperformed most of the industry. Um, in, terms of, in terms of surveillance in, in China and US, I think, you know, I think a large part of the progress that's been made around surveillance in, in China has been based on a different value of data privacy um, between the two economies, right? So I, I think the um, uh, China has managed to collect much more data and do much more with it, but it's you know it's at a cost, right? So the the question, I think the bigger question is not can they catch up. Um, the question is what is the right trade-off between kind of getting better at AI uh, and surveillance and so on and um, and the data privacy that we have that we feel comfortable with as uh, as citizens living in, in both of those countries. And I think every culture is going to be different in, in terms of where those balances are. That's, I think it's, it opens a, a, a different debate too, but it's it I does. Think a very, a very, <laughs> very spot on um, uh, answer, I think. I'm afraid we need to close this webinar. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Andrew, and, and I think we did have a very engaged audience. I'm sorry we couldn't cover all the questions. Uh, you know, I, I encourage you to get in touch with us in the center. Andrew is actually uh, joining, you know, the Sorry Code as one of our external members too. So hopefully we'll have other opportunities to engage. Um, and over to you, Richard, just to say bye and see you next time. Yeah, and let me also note this won't be the last code uh, related session in Digital Disruptors. So do keep an eye out if you're on the email list. Uh, for future events. So thank you again, Andrew, for a wonderful session. Thank you to the audience for wonderful questions, and we hope to see you again soon. Um, I, uh, it's been a real pleasure. I thought the, the questions were fantastic. They really kind of displayed the, uh, I think, much bigger picture topics. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. We'll see Bye, you everyone. soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.